Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is about uh, the Japan Identity Clash, a book recently published by Columbia University Press. And with us to talk about the book is its co-author, Brad Glosserman. Brad, in addition, is Executive Director of Pacific Forum, CSIS, our friends just down the street here. Uh, and then, moreover, he served on the editorial board for the Japan Times for a number of years, and his analyses and commentary appears in a number of publications around the world. Welcome to Asian Review. Thanks, Bill. Pleasure to be here. And just to correct, it's the Japan-South Korea identity clash. While Japan has its own identity issues, it's not quite that schizophrenic. Okay, good, good. Let's jump right into it. Um, by the way, though, first, before we do that, uh, sorry, could you put that graphic of the book up on the screen? There we go. Thank you. There we go. Um, let's get into it. What's the book all about? The book is an attempt to explain a very interesting phenomenon that we've observed in, in, in Northeast Asia over the last couple of decade or so, which is why is it that Japan and South Korea, two countries that by many external standards should seem to be uh, American allies, or, or should seem to be countries that are working together for a common purpose and common objectives, and instead, despite similar geographic positions, the fact that they're both in Northeast Asia, the fact mm -hmm. that they're American allies, the fact that they share values, that they have share interests, that they are liberal democracies, market economies, committed to an international uh, order that frankly serves both interests very well. Why is it that instead of cooperating, the two of them seem to be increasingly in conflict and working at cross purposes rather than together mm -hmm. and with the United States? So. I mean, the traditional realist model of international relations would suggest that two countries would f be able to orient towards a shared threat, particularly North Korea, but China in some cases as well, and that's an interesting and complex question. How is it then that they're not, and in fact, despite the fact that both see Pyongyang as a, a genuine threat, in some cases existential threat, to their survival and their security, why is it instead that they're not cooperating and seem to be focusing so much energy on, on each other? The conclusion that Scott Snyder, my author, who is at the Council on Foreign Relations, is a, a very old friend of mine and is really one of the preeminent scholars of Korea, North and South, in the United States and elsewhere, we concluded that you needed to look beyond the traditional explanations. And, and one of the factors or, or, or explanatory variables for us was this notion of national identity. How these countries see themselves, see them, their place in the region, their place in the world, how they relate to each other and others, this offered us a powerful explanation for their behavior and for the way the two countries work together, or don't. Well, <clears throat> briefly, <clears throat> how would you describe Japanese identity at this point? Uh, how about Korean identity? What sort of evolution have they gone through? And your book gets into these uh, sorts of issues. We offer a chapter on, you know, that sort of sets up the, the whole notion of why we think identity matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you think about it, who you are helps you determine what's important, what you value, what you consider to be a threat. And so this, this fundamental notion of who you are, where you fit into the world, really is the cornerstone of, of foreign policy as well as in many other policies. So for us, we, we start with explaining why national identity seems to be a, a focus. The second chapter looks at Japan. The mm -hmm. third chapter looks at South Korea and answers, addresses particularly this question. Well, it's fascinating if, if I can answer it in reverse. Sure. You go to South Korea and we said, how do you define South Korea identity? And we, we, we conducted both our own survey from the database that my organization has, and it had an N of about 140 different experts on security and international relations, et cetera, and about another 140 Japanese. We asked them a series of questions. We looked at public opinion surveys over years in, uh, from the Pew uh, Foundation, from the Pew Fund, uh, the Global Research, the Chicago Council on Foreign Affairs. We looked at all different surveys because no single survey offers you a good answer to this. You have to look at them across time and be able to compare questions and compare. Let, let me jump in here a second. Um, so the 140 names in mm -hmm. your uh, Pacific Forum's database, you mm -hmm. sent out questionnaires mm -hmm. to these folks. What kind of return did you get? No, um, about 140. I mean, that was the end. that was the end we got. Uh, it was we sent out more than that. And that was about 140. Was the response oh, rate? Okay. I'm sorry. So we have. I mean, we have several hundred, if not a thousand, people that we would from each so of the countries. Ten or fifteen percent. Fifteen yeah, probably, yeah. but okay. I, by no means that, is that's that reasonably good. Though. It's okay, but it's very much a self-selected group. We understand that these are foreign policy people, so sure. they're going to have a slightly different take. Right. Nonetheless, we took. Our survey, we compared it with other surveys, and in fact, some of the questions we may have taken, we took, were lifted from other surveys, so we had comparability. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we went and to each country and did uh, interviews with opinion leaders of politicians, people that do our work, 
Um, Scott and I have each done, you know, been working, I've been working in Japan since 1991, Scott's in, in Korea since like 1989, I think. Mm. Um, and we, of course, we travel to each country five, six times a year. We have mm. international conferences daily and meetings, weekly, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're building all of this together to create this composite, all of that by way of background. So you go to Korea and you ask, what is the foundation of Korean identity? And the Koreans say, no problem. We're a liberal market economy. We're a vibrant democracy. We're a confident country. We're a um, divided country. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, perennial constant in South Korean identity is, and we are a shrimp among whales. We are a vulnerable country that does not have control over its future and is very much at the mercy of larger forces. It's, it's interesting that you mention all those factors, but you, you, you don't mention anything about sort of the Confucian background of Korean society. Yeah, I mean, isn't that all part of the identity as well? It is, but it's certainly, I think that when you're talking to people in a certain context, I mean, I think if we'd asked larger questions, and we do, we address some social issues because we, I think you had to, you need to look at questions of equity, of equality, and, and I mean, a Confucian component of that comes into it, but I think we were framing this in a foreign policy context. We were mostly asking questions about friends, about warmth towards other countries, mm. about relationships with China, Russia. Who is most mm. like you? How do you feel? Who is your best friend? Who, whose interests are most like yours? Whose values? So uh, there was, I think, a way at getting at that Confucian component if mm -hmm. we chose to, and you mm -hmm. might be able to tease out some of those results, mm -hmm. but we weren't looking at that. So I would say that would be a second order discussion. Um, the, but the focus is obviously very contemporary. I, oh, absolutely. But no. mostly, again, in the foreign policy context, it was an even right. more bounded discussion. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, but, and all of that Korea stuff was by way of background, what was most fascinating to us was we went to the, to the Japanese and we said, all right, how do you define Japanese identity? And we got nothing. Um, we would ask, how is it that you, you know, what are the core components of your identity? And they didn't understand the question. We continually rephrased it until we got one that actually started getting answers. And the question that got answers was, how do you think other people see your country? Which is actually an interesting element mm. of identity as well. And it's one that's frankly quite consistent with the critique of people like Funabashi Yoichi, who's a, a fairly famous, a very famous journalist, perhaps one of the most famous journalists in Japan, who has now set up his own think tank to work on some of these questions about Japan uh, and its progress in the aftermath of uh, two lost decades, and particularly after the March 11, 2011 uh, Fukushima uh, Daiichi nuclear accident, the, the earthquake and tsunami. But the Japanese, so to, to go back to your original question, and I, I hope the digression wasn't too digressive. Um, <laughs> no, it's a substantive answer, just like the, the, like the, the well-written paragraphs that permeate the book. Oh, well, there you go. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the Japanese identity becomes one of a country that is extremely, you know, that, 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 that sees itself in some ways as kind of foundering. And, or maybe I'm interpolating. Let me, let me give you the answer that comes out of the data that we get, which is this is a country that is extremely proud of its capacity to catch up, that has, over the course of history, in repeated junctures, come from nowhere to rise out uh, and, and accomplish great things with an extraordinarily limited set of resources. If you think of Japan, it's an island country that is small, that is largely surrounded by hostile countries. We can leave aside why that hostility exists. Mm -hmm. But it, it has built a great nation out of very little natural resources other than the people itself. 90% of Jap Japanese energy, of everything, is imported into the country. And it is 127 million people today, and it's, that's one of the peaks of its, of its population, and it will be declining. We've seen the, the, sure. the high point of, of Japanese population. Um, and the country will, uh, uh, despite that, and, and from you know, the burnt out rubble of 1945 in the aftermath of war, it built the largest, most, or the second largest, most successful economy in the world by 1990, that in people in America thought was soon to overtake the U.S., sure. was supposedly had fashioned solutions to the problems of capitalism that, you know, uh, scholar Chalmers Johnson had said that the Cold War is over and Japan has won. Um, and we expected, if you recall back the fever and hysteria of the late 80s and early 90s. We did think the Japanese were going to overtake us. It's very interesting that you quote Chalmers <coughs> Johnson because a lot of people are sort of hesitant to do so these days. But I had him as an undergraduate, and those are in the days before he uh, turned the leaf the other way and uh, you know, started going down the other side of the political spectrum. But I, I think he did a lot of great work. Yeah, Charles a brilliant, was a brilliant man. And I mean, I would be very careful that he never 
I, I think he took some of his arguments to a slightly more extreme conclusion, and I'm a huge fan of his work. And he, yeah. he said he has, a, he has a great... I'm glad to hear you say that, because I can talk to a lot of Jap Japanologists who just the mention of Chalmers Johnson since I'm climbing the wall. Age. He got shrill in his, <laughs> in his later years. But he was always someone... I mean, Chalmers, his, his critique of Japan was always that it was a country that singularly focused on national purpose and national security. And he may have oversold his model. I mean, the, in retrospect, the degree to which Mitty or Mitty at the time was the all-powerful bureaucracy right, that he painted right. and that it was singularly focused and so incredibly inefficient. I mean, if all of that was true, then clearly Japan would not have been in the doldrums for the two decades that followed the collapse of, of, the, of the Cold War. And still is. Right. Yeah. And, and we can have that conversation if you like. That's the subject of my next book. Um, uh, and so... Uh, my point would just be that, I, I, that Chow was always focused on the way that the United States needed to focus on its own national interests in the way that the Japanese did. And there was a sense, I think, that he felt that we had gotten, you know, his, his book about imperial over, books about imperial overstretch and overreach suggested that we had lost sight of where our real national interests lie and that we needed to be more focused on that, like countries like, uh, like, like Japan, and perhaps I think he would probably say Israel today. But. Good point. You know, um, you sent me a copy of your recent article in the Washington Quarterly, Japan, Model or Model. Right. And, you know, I, I felt a little bit down after reading that. Only um, a little? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's like, this is Japan. It doesn't seem like it's going to rise to the occasion. It, it's, it's risen to the occasion so many times in the past. I sort of expected that it would, you know, especially after Fukushima, but... You seem to suggest that, well, Japan, Japanese think they're comfortable enough and they're really not um, hung up on being number one like they were in the 80s. They lost that motivation, if you want to call it that. And I, I know it left me a little bit uh, Good. Then, then down. You, yeah. Well, you got, then you got the point. Um, I mean, let's be careful. The argument about Japan in this book and that book are similar, but I take... There's far more, uh, and, and the overlap of the writing of the two was such that while 80% of this book was done prior to the beginning of that other, the research on that other project, there's some overlap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it clearly influences it. And, and truthfully, to go to your larger question, I th or, or your original question, mm -hmm. what is Japan's identity today? It's a country that's confused. Mm -hmm. Because it is a country, go back to Chalmers Johnson in 1991, it is a country that thought it had the answers and it, it had evolved a superior form of capitalism that really suited this particular country and the, and the circumstances in which Japan lived and operated and the world in which it existed. And the problem is, is that it lost its footing. And if you were in Japan as I was in 93, 94, and 95... How I mean, was there throughout the 80s? The high point in Japanese history, perhaps. And, and you know, to a degree... Well, perhaps. To a degree, um, I think that the, the fact that I was in Japan in the 1990s is really important because it fundamentally changes my perspective. I know many people that were there in the 80s, like you, and, or, or in the 70s, and for them, Japan's trajectory was always upward. Yeah. In my sense, I've only known a Japan that really never was able to come to grips with the, with the problems it faced and consequently foundered. So I don't have that faith. I have the historical understanding of Japan's successes, but I don't have the first-hand knowledge, as I was about to say, in 93 and 94, when I would ask my Japanese friends and whatever, how come you're not addressing these issues? Their answer was, pendulum swing. We'll get back to it. You right. know, the, yeah. the time circumstances will change. The problem is the world was changing in fundamental ways, and therefore the Japanese weren't making the adjustments that they needed to. So the second book, if you will, and, and I want to come back let's, to this. Let's, let's come back to that because we have to no. take a break oh, right okay. here. Okay. You're watching Asian Review. My uh, guest today is Brad Glossaman. We're discussing his book, um, Books. Uh, Jap book? <laughs> <laughs> Japan, South Korea, Identity Clash. Um, we're having a great discussion, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina 
president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is uh, Barai Glossaman. We've been discussing his new book, uh, Japan South Korea Identity Clash. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, had a lot of discussion about Japan's identity. We probably want to go back to that and wrap it up and then uh, talk a bit about South Korea and then move on. Japan's identity. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll beat you to it. Um, so I think that a country that thought that it had evolved this higher form of capitalism that had really come up with the answers to the problems that were besetting the society, that seemed that it had worked all of this out, suddenly found itself stumbling and unable to adjust in ways that permitted it to break out of the slump. And it was a combination of economic factors, we call it the lost decades, but complicated by an overlay of political issues. I mean, the Japanese went through a prime minister every year since basically <laughs> 1991. Revolving door. Worse than a revolving yeah. door. And, and so, and, and that very fact has both real-world implications in the sense that if you think about how governments work, you think about the United States president, for example, why should a U.S. president go to Japan, have, make time out of his incredibly busy schedule with all of the competing interests when the person that he's there to talk to has barely gotten his feet wet, will likely not be in the office in a while, will not be able to make the, deliver the promises or the policy commitments that he makes. So the result becomes, a, a, you know, if you will, a, a downplaying of that particular relationship. And then that has a psychological effect as well on the people of Japan, as well as on the people that are trying to take care of that relationship. You know, um, <clears throat> it's, it's often occurred to me that um, part of the identity problem here between Japan and South Korea and the way that it impacts their relationship with the United States and therefore America's ideas about rebalance is that South Koreans feel, it seems to me, that the United States um, gives greater attention to its relationship with Japan at the cost of its relationship with South Korea. What's your response to that? That's a pretty good assessment. I mean, there's no question that the South Koreans see themselves as an aggrieved younger brother in some respects in this relationship. And the Japanese and the South Koreans will resent very much me saying this, but nonetheless benchmark the U.S. relationship with Japan on so many different levels as a way of gauging where, how they're treating. So, you know, it, the United States relationship with Japan has invariably been called the most important bilateral relationship bar none, Ambassador Mike Mansfield. Up to this point, anyway. Well, we even still use that boilerplate, but it was always the cornerstone of U.S. engagement. Mm -hmm. That's because we had where we had so many of our bases and because we had such a huge troop presence. Suddenly in 2009 and even earlier, or actually 2009, we start referring to the U.S.-Japan relationship, or the U.S.-Korea relationship as a linchpin. And the Japanese start getting nervous. I mean, a linchpin, single or plural? I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, 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 which is bigger, a linchpin or a cornerstone? And so you've got a, a genuine sense among the two countries that they are, I mean, the, the Koreans have always been the aggrieved younger brother, if you will. And again, it, yeah. it, this sounds patronizing, it sounds condescending. I need to, I suppose, be a bit careful. But there is a sense in South Korea where they do look at, at Tokyo and see it as a benchmark. The Japanese, I think, have been, are quite frankly, a little more patronizing. They look back at the South Koreans and think, um, first of all, I don't think they think much of them. In more recent years, they've decided that they need to be more cognizant of this, that they see the South Koreans, if you will, in the rear view mirror, catching up with them. Japan, I think, realizes in more recent years that it needs to be more conscious about Asia as a whole than it has been in the past. Well, I mean, the classic Japanese foreign policy choice, or even the identity issue since the Meiji Restoration has been Asia or the West, and, and the choice that was made in, in, in the 1868 was, was, was Datsua, out of Asia. Asia yeah, right. was backwards, right. and the West was where you got all your learning and knowledge and advancement. Right. And so Japan 
again, in, in this extraordinary catch-up period, and just a, a marvel, you know, I think an, an incredible in demonstration of what Japan is capable of, caught up with the rest of the world. I mean, if you think of the, the way that the West, in the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, looked at Asia, they were backwards, they were colonies, I mean, the best you could be patronizing and say it was up to the white man to, white man, of course, to, okay. to um, you know, to, um, to, to, to bring enlightenment to them. And of course, we did it at our own sweet time, at our own pace, and uh, through our own resources, mm. through their resources, you know, so right. we exploited them. The Japanese instead, 1895 beat China, 1905 beat the Russians, beat a world power. Right. And defeat them in, 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 uh, in, in and, and then use that as the springboard. They become as ruthless and as efficient a, a, an imperialist and a colonist, as the Western col does. colonialist, as, as the Western does. And that leads to war. You know, it seems to me on the Korea side that, that, that there's probably some angst about the fact that, uh, well, a, a lot of Japanese culture, <clears throat> traditionally speaking, came to Japan from China, but via Korea. Sure, Korea of course. I mean, Koreans played a very important role in the earliest days of Japanese history. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, the I emperor's that acknowledged that he's, the emperor and, said and he's... the emperor's acknowledged there's some Korean blood here. He says, I am Korean, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, um, yeah quite interesting. Well, um, you know, I'm not sure that we made this absolutely clear to our audience that how this identity clash between Japan and South Korea affects U.S. policy, how it affects the rebalance. Sure. Let's talk about the rebalance because everybody's got a little bit different interpretation of it. I think your book does a good job of laying out a good, solid definition. Um, Could you elaborate? Sure. I mean, the rebalance is typically and oversimplistically seen as an attempt by the United States to finally acknowledge the rise of Asia and the creation of a tripolar world. And historically, the U.S. has been transatlantic in its foreign policy, and now what we're going to do is acknowledge the rise of a third pole and bring Asia up in our estimation. That's the easy and, frankly, the, the, the extremely simple version. There is, in addition, I think a rebalance within Asia, and that is we've essentially focused historically on Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, China. And in fact, there's a rise of Southeast Asia. So there's been a sub-regional rebalance within our assessment. The belief has been that we've, by and large, gotten Northeast Asia right. Our policies are working fairly well with, you know, we can quibble, but we've got the broad pieces in line. We have neglected Southeast Asia, and therefore we need to focus that on some more. The third piece of the rebalance is a rebalance internally within the U.S. foreign policy toolkit. In other words, historically, again, the weight of U.S. engagement in the region has been borne by the military. And in fact, to better respond to the realities of the 21st century, to better respond to the prerogatives and the preferences of, the, of, of East Asian countries, what we really should be doing is leading both with forward-based diplomacy, as it was called in, in Hillary Clinton's seminal article in uh, November of 2011, the, the Pacific Century. She said, we lead with forward-based diplomacy, and then secondly, it's economics. And that's why so much of this focus in discussion of TPP. Um, and then only third, do we focus on the military. So these are the three rebalances that we need to be talking about. Well, <clears throat> and wait, so wait, sorry, to, to, to tie into the, okay. the other piece of it. Finally, and so what's important is, I think, in the world in which we now are living, mm -hmm. given the nature of the challenges in East Asia and the world more broadly, and I think given the certain the fiscal realities of the United States, acknowledging the limits of what, it, what we have to do is be more creative in the use of, of, of our, we need to be more creative and more efficient in how we marshal our resources. And the way we do that is getting away from what we've historically called a hub and spoke pattern. I was hoping that's where I wanted you to go. Well, there's the, the, the Let, $64,000. Let's talk dollars. about that because I think this puts it in clear perspective. Sure. The movement of U.S. Policy, policy from a hub and spoke model to mm -hmm. the rebalance, which essentially requires each country to work more closely and more efficiently with, with each other. Right. Rather and, than just with the United States. And clearly this is the case here. But Japan and South Korea, they're not working well together because of this identity issue. Among others. How do we get yes. around that? Well, uh, and that's when we get to the last piece. But, I mean, you've got to also be careful because... We're leading up there. <laughs> yeah, I love that. You've, you've skillfully crafted this discussion, Bill. Um, I mean, you. part of the problem, too, though, in the Japanese case in particular, is that the Japanese have legal and, and constitutional restrictions on what they can do in the security sphere. And that's, that raises all sorts of additional issues that, that, that we can take up if you want to talk Japan. But... The point is, is that the United States has recognized we need to better leverage the, the efficiencies and comparative advantages of our partners, whether they're allies or partners, countries like, say, Singapore, that aren't 
one of our allies in Asia, but with whom we work very closely. Countries like Vietnam, with whom we're discovering considerable common purpose and common sense of objectives. You know, so that, we need a, to start putting everybody together. That, that, that's a really good point because, you know, it seems when we talk about rebalance, we're talking about three key players here. We're talking about Japan, we're talking about Australia, and we're talking about the United States. And we need some more meat on the bones. Now, you say Singapore is not really an ally. It's close to the U.S., but it's not as closely identified to the rebalance as these other countries. Um, no, I th I, it is, if you look. It's just a question of what you're focusing on. And mind you, we do have probably the most effective example of trilateralism, as we call this, is the, what we call the trilateral strategic dialogue between Tokyo, Canberra, and Washington. It's precisely that Japan-U.S.-Australia triangle that you mentioned. How about the Philippines? Now, militarily, it's a weak country, but can uh, we consider those a key player in the rebalance or um, a player of any We would bank? like to make them, but they're, they're not because their capacity, their limited capacity for, for all sorts of, of for diplomatic initiatives, their economy is growing, but they're still weak. I mean, it becomes a question of the degree to which countries not only can take care of their own defense problems, but their, their ability to co contribute on a range of issues and a range of modalities to the solution of larger regional security issues. The fact of the matter is, the Philippines have limited capability. They're hard pressed to defend their own territory, which is one of the sure. reasons why, you know, they're they're actually asking the United States to bring its forces back after deciding that they'd had enough. What a turnaround! Uh, um, it's funny what 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 a grim look at reality will do for you. <laughs> what but, a good, that's a great way to put it. But but you know, to go back to your question, so you know, the the question, the issue becomes, how is it that we best leverage our efficiencies, and how is it, we look at the United States? Japan and South Korea, and we see three countries that should be addressing a common threat, threat North Korea. That we all agree on. China is a little more problematic, so let's put that aside. But these three countries need to be working together. And instead, what we see... Three countries we're talking about, Japan... South Korea and the United States. Okay, but South Korea is really not. I mean, it's basically, the rebalance now is basically a U.S., Japan, Australia. No, 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 that, I wouldn't but say is, that at would all. Would you say South Korea is in on the rebalance? Absolutely. I mean, okay. they're, they're involved in it. I mean, because the rebalance... Because the relationship with China sometimes cloaks that No, no, I, I, that's an easily... Yeah, that's a very common misperception. And okay. it's one of which I'm happy to, to, to mistake, or okay. one, not to mistake, to correct. There are people that believe that somehow or other Seoul is shifting into the Chinese camp. And there are people that believe within, you know, a decade's time, uh, South Korea will be an ally of the Chinese and, and that somehow or other the alliance with the United States will be right. Well, I don't that's, think that'll happen, but... Uh, uh, some people do. People yeah. that, that, that have made careers on this. And I think that's just silly. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the fact of the matter is, you know, the South Koreans understand two things. Number one, their belief is, is that China has leverage over Pyongyang. And why, quite truthfully, I think that leverage is far less than most people well, I would agree with you. I think that's overstated. But nevertheless, there's some, if any country has some influence, it would be China. Mm. So Seoul needs to have good relations with Beijing to be able then to influence Pyongyang. But South Koreans have assured us since before the Park government, since Madam Park became president, that they understand this as a tactical relationship. And as they've made very clear, I mean, explicitly in some conversations, they've said, our relationship with the United States is one that was formed, a partnership and an alliance that was formed in blood. Our relationship with China is based on profit. Okay. I think it's a fairly stark statement. In a way, that, that wait, typifies wait, the rebalance, doesn't it? Well, we want security relations with the U.S., but we want the Chinese market. No, I mean, that's a, again, let's be careful. Let's, 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 separ let's, let's separate. But let's go back again to this other, this other question about South Korea. So number one is this tactical approach to, to Beijing. Number two, equally important though, is the understanding among South Koreans that much of their leverage and their importance to China, mm -hmm. and I think it, and some of their capacity to act is a function of their relationship and their alliance with the United States. In other words, they're standing on the alliance as a platform, okay. as a way. So, so I mean, I would, to, to, to members of our audience that ask questions about South Korean commitment, don't be worried. I, I, I lose no sleep over this. I don't think we should either. I mean, there's a very clear sense that, that among the folks that know, that, that and again, the, the survey data shows a, very, a, a great closeness with the United States in terms of values, in terms of objectives, in terms of interests, and a, a certain distance, your Confucian culture, not with um, <laughs> uh to China. Good. Let's take another break here. Uh, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. We'll be right back, and we're going to hear, when we come back, we're going to hear how this uh, problem about identity can be solved. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course, you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because 
This is an arts show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. And we don't on only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you center stage. Welcome back to Asian Review. We're having a really interesting discussion here uh, about uh, Japanese and South Korean identity and how it impacts the accomplishment of U.S. policy in East Asia. Let's finish up what we were talking about here, uh, South Korean uh, identity. Or South Korea's role in the rebalance, really. Role in the rebalance. And rebalance, I think that, you know, the, since Im Young bak the former president of South Korea, talked about a global Korea role, mm -hmm. I think what you've had is an attempt by Seoul to recognize that as the 11th or 13th largest economy in the world, depending on whose numbers you use. This is a country that has increasingly far-flung interests. Historically, South Korea has focused on peninsula affairs. Mm -hmm. I mean, the economy hasn't that been big, and frankly, North Korea has thrown a large enough shadow that it really needed to stay focused on, the, on events close to home. Im Young bak recognized that, that South Korea has done more, and it needs to be a player more global, it, it, more widely in the region and in the world. Mm. And so this global Korea language has dropped away, but we're looking instead to see, we're looking still to see South Korea as a player in partnering with the United States. It, the, it's interesting enough that, you know, um, Australia, for example, has been able to make progress in creating a relationship with Seoul that parallels the relationship that, that Canberra has with um, with Tokyo as well, and uh, I was having lunch, in fact, with the Australian Consul General today, and he was telling mm -hmm. me that you know no country really has such powerful relationships with with Seoul and Tokyo as Australia does, and this I think is a reflection precisely of that attempt to engage Korea with other partners in away from the peninsula in ways that serve the ba the rebalance. So Australia can be a great help in helping to without question. S straighten this problem out and, and um, getting the countries working more smoothly together. Uh, I, there is a perception in some ways, and, and quite w interestingly enough, that the United States has its own interest and therefore there is a friction is created by the notion that when the U.S. is trying to push trilateralism in Northeast Asia, there can be a sense in Japan and in Korea that the U.S. is pushing its own interests, which of course we are, but we would argue that <laughs> it's in behalf of their interests as well, <laughs> right. So. In theory, what ends up happening is when the Australians engage, you get this sense that Australia has a, is a more neutral agenda. Okay. Let's get into the solution. We have uh, plenty of time left, but 11 minutes. I think that should give us enough time to really get into this uh, um, you know, solution, which is multifaceted, and uh, possibly bring up a few other things. The, um, we offer two sets of solutions in the book. The argument is, is that, you know, essentially, we need to figure out a way to overcome the identity clash. And so there are two pieces to this. The first is what we call the lowest common denominator approach, and we're seeing some of this in work already. Mm -hmm. But what, what that consists of is you need the leadership, the top leadership of the three countries, the United States, Japan, and South Korea, meeting mm -hmm. at every opportunity. We mm -hmm. should be pushing to have leadership level summits. We do this at the National Security Summit that was held in The Hague, um, ad hoc uh, moments elsewhere. Um, but we should be doing it regularly, whether it's APEC, whether it is the East Asia Summit, where it's the United Nations General Assembly. Every time that the three leaders are in the same postal code, they should be sitting down, they should be making a statement, they should be taking photographs, hopefully, that make them look happy together, mm -hmm. although some mm -hmm. pictures haven't always been that, that good. But where they're making <laughs> statements on behalf of trilateralism, sending a signal to their It, it couldn't look any worse than that handshake between Xi Jinping and Abe. Well, that's just it. Couldn't it, look right? any worse uh, than that. Even, uh, <laughs> if you'll recall, I think the photographs of, of Park and Abe at the, and at the, the National Security Summit in The Hague weren't, weren't terribly uh, enlivening either. But nevertheless, the point is that they need to be sending a signal both to their governments and to their bureauc and, and to their people about the value of these relationships. And it should be the, the, the foreign ministers as well, the defense ministers. At the same time, we should be pushing a bottom-up level, working level set of um, exchanges and similar coordination, whether it's the policy planning staffs 
at the, the, their, their, their ministries. We should have the two alliances, uh, U.S. Forces Korea, U.S. Forces Japan, those two alliances coordinating. We should be having over ODA, Overseas Development Assistance Coordination. All of this at the working level is a way of creating, if you will, a thicker web and a thicker weave of, of, of relationships. Let, let That's the easy this, one. Let me ask this question, um, as long as we're talking about leaders here and, and more dialogue and more interaction. Given Mr. Abe's background, political background, and, and you know that goes to his relatives. Of his grandfather. Grandfather. Say it. His grandfather. Miss Park's father, uh, Park uh, Chung Hee. Are they really? Are they leaders that are capable of pulling off this change, or do they have too much baggage? In theory, yes, they're capable of it. In reality, probably. I don't want to say no because I. I, I I don't want to be, be too optimist. pessimistic. I don't want to be an optimist. But this takes us, Bill, to the second question, or the, the second recommend, set of recommendations we have, which, which we would call the grand bargain. And, or the other way to put it is, is that if we would call this the leadership option, and the first one is what we call the bureaucratic option. Okay. And by the leadership option, what, what we suggest is that the three countries, including the United States, make bold moves to address the questions of history and the reciprocal notions of engagement and dealing with the past that they have. So, for example, the United States would make a statement and would lead in the context of recognizing the fact that its fingerprints are on every important decision in East Asia mm. basically since the 1900s, okay. you know, that, that we are deeply engaged. And this is anathema. I mean, I'm not, a, this is a, a very contentious subject. Sure. And, 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 and it goes to a great deal of depth of uh, gr great unease in the United States government today about playing a, far, a, a forward leaning role in so far as there's a feeling that we'll be forced to take sides. And I'm not suggesting that. Right. What I am saying is, is that we have to acknowledge that we have played a role and that some of the outcomes that we're trying to deal with today that are obstacles are the result of, of American decisions. So that's number one. On the Japanese part, what we call for is a... Um, okay, give us a clear example here. Sure. Are you, are, you, are you getting to Dukdo? Are you getting to... Are you talking about the Senkakus? Um, are you talking I'm, about all of it? All of it. I mean, it, it needs... And, and we're offering... What we're suggesting is the way to engage and to think about it. And obviously, a lot of this will be the result of diplomatic thinking, of historical assessment. It will be decisions at executive levels, top levels. And frankly, there will be negotiations. But this cannot be seen, as you will see, it cannot be seen as a quid pro quo or a transactional deal. This has to be seen as what the theorists would call a series of, of unilateral recipro reciprocal unilateral measures. Okay. That, that these countries have to be seen as doing it for their own interest. So that's the U.S. piece. The Japanese piece, and, and you know, for example, the decisions we need to be reckoning with are the decisions to uh, drop atomic bombs, the firebombing of Tokyo, the fact that we drew the 38th parallel that divided North and South Korea, that we played a key role in the negotiation of the Treaty of Portsmouth that mm -hmm. opened the door mm -hmm. to Japanese mm -hmm. imperial uh, colonization of, of Northeast Asia, mm -hmm. that we, uh, you know, there was the Washington Treaty, there, was, there were right. all sorts of the treaty of San Francisco, which, which created many of the territorial disputes by not resolving them. Right. Um, <laughs> right. You know, the right. fact that it was the United States that scotched the... Um, uh, negotiations between U uh, Japan and Russia in 1956 on the northern let, territory. Let me, let me uh, back up there a second. Now, when you talk about um, the United States to take certain responsibility for the atomic bombing of um, Japan at the end of the war, uh, I just have trouble seeing that if the United States should take the, pursue that line, I can imagine every veterans organization in the country and many other quarters of public opinion would... I, well, be, and I understand that, Bill, but, but let's... Uh, be noisy. I get that. And we, we, we found that in 1995. How is it that we cannot take responsibility for that? I mean, mm -hmm. we did it, didn't yeah. we? That, so let's be careful. I mean, it seems to me taking responsibility is one issue. Mm -hmm. You're talking about apologizing for that. And mm -hmm. that's another matter altogether. And that's one we'll get to. But, but in the interest of How time... How do you separate the two, though? Uh, carefully. <laughs> but but let, let me... Like let me, Siamese twins, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, this is the art of diplomacy, but it's, it, uh, we're leaders. Leaders require us to do things that are hard. And, and, and I think that there are ways that we can that allow us to ex exact leadership. And that goes to your question. Remember, we started with Park and Abe about that. I mean, mm -hmm. what are we asking this of them and not of ourselves? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's keep going forward okay. because the, the, the clock's ticking. We've got about five minutes here. We've got a lot to cover. I know. So and so we talked about Abe. About so, what is, so what does Abe do? I mean, what the Japanese need to do is they need to, I would argue, uh, renounce their claim to Takeshima, or what the, the South Koreans call Dokdo, because the islands are occupied, effectively occupied by South Korea. The Japanese have said they will never retake them by force. The Constitution 
repudiates the use of force as, a, as law, uh, as an instrument of policy. They don't have the mechanisms, the means, the military to do so. So I agree with you. They, they should give up on Takashima. Right. I mean, the so, Koreans are there. They're not going away. Right. So it seems to me that you, you let that go. Then I would also argue but you no, offer cash payments. Uh, no, 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 let's keep going because we're going to run out of time, Bill. Seriously. <laughs> okay. and, I wanna, and it's important to get all this because it, it all has to fit together. Okay. You've, I would argue as well that the Japanese need to be, need to be making pay cash payments to the comfort women, the surviving comfort okay. women. There's legal issues pertinent to that, but I think you can make an exception that would argue that this is such a special, spectacular set of circumstances that this is what we should do. So that's what I argue the Japanese should do. The South Koreans essentially say, we will accept all that, and we will, that will close the door on the past. That we will now look forward rather than back, and we will, we will not be using the use of history. We will not be using history as a tool to bludgeon, to use it as a cornerstone of our identity, which is a big ask of the South Koreans, mm -hmm. instead to beat up on the Japanese, and we will instead work together. Now, in addition, what we, we, we would call for in, in you know, some of our more creative moments is a new treaty of friendship and cooperation okay. between the two countries, Japan okay. and South Korea, where they renounce the use of force to settle all the disputes, where they acknowledge Korea, the future of a Korea, unified Korean peninsula under Seoul, acknowledge a Japanese security role in the region, where they identify their shared objectives, concerns, and goals, where they also then identify a shared holiday that the two countries can celebrate together. And the role of, of, of that, in theory, creates the foundation, the floor of a new relationship that allows them to surmount the past and move forward. The hope that we take from this, I mean, you know, now to go to your question of, of leadership, it's all about leadership. Um, and it's about courage. And let me tie together another point that, that we were making earlier. If you believe, as I do, that Japan's trajectory has peaked, and that from now on, mm -hmm. Japan ha will be, continue to be an extraordinary country, but never have the population size or the economy that it did. Mm -hmm. If you believe that Japanese national power has peaked or plateaued, then as a strategic matter, it is best for the Japanese to strike a bargain with South Korea now while their leverage is the best it will be. Mm. So that's, that's, that's one strategic argument for this. I would then appeal to the vanity, frankly, of the leadership in, in South Korea, and particularly in Mr. Abe, and I would say, you, you want to be a great leader. You're going to be a pretty good prime minister if you, for all the things you've accomplished, and nevertheless, but your record will be mixed given mm. the reaction to so much of what you've done. But if you by doing this, making your Nixon to China trip, which is what the closest political equivalent of this is, or, or Sadat to, 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 to a Jerusalem trip, mm -hmm. you do that, and you've done the equivalent of transforming yourself from a good, not bad, Japanese prime minister into a world historical figure that has transformed the relationship. And similarly for Madam Park. Now, the Japanese response to all of this is, is that you're asking too much, and most importantly, the South Koreans would never, Weapon. ever, uh, you know, accept this. To which our reply is, and it, if you do that, then the world will know that it's not Japan that's the problem. Mm, interesting. You know, um, I, I, um, I agree with you on Dokto, as I mentioned. I think the Japanese should just forget it. Um, your book says that this will not complicate their territorial claims with other, uh, other parties. I, and I can't wonder, I just wonder how that would impact their issue with Russia over the Kuros. Uh, there's, we have about 30 seconds, it's unfair. It's a long... <laughs> pop that question out at that I would say end. that it, it... But it can be worked out. The problem, of course, is that as I look at Russian policy making and Mr. Putin in particular, this is a man who takes territory who doesn't give it up. So I'm not <laughs> sure that there's much to be lost. Well, that's a good point. That is, that's a really good point. Um, I can't help but to wonder if Imam Bak might have been a, a more suited uh, as a leader at this particular time than Madame Park. Maybe. Yeah. I thought he did well until the very end. Uh, and then he... His visit to Dokto it. has been a real problem. But that, that right. actually, Bill, that, that, that might be a good assessment. You, you've been watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Um, we want to thank you for joining us here today. We've had a really lively discussion with Vlad Grossman. He's obviously full of ideas. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, his next book coming out. And we'll, we'll have to invite him back to uh, talk about that. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.